Hey everybody, Ben Gothard here with another Project Egg interview. And today we're talking to Wally Carmichael from Phoenix, Arizona. How you doing, Wally? Uh, man, I'm amazing. How you doing, Ben? Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time, and I'm I'm loving that scenery, man. Where are you? I'm on the west side of Oahu. Uh, I live out here in this little beach community, and um, I've been in Hawaii a total of nine years, but I had a three-year break, so six years at this point in time, and and uh, yeah, just sitting out here on the beach where I normally have my morning coffee and just kind of hanging out. Wow, that's fantastic. So before we dive into it, uh, would you mind just showing uh, the, the audience a little bit around and, and maybe sure. giving, a, giving a 360 view real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Let's uh, move the camera around here a little bit. So I'm sitting in a gazebo right now uh, down the street from my house. Normally I'm in the one right across the street from my house, which is you can barely see the little pyramid down there. That's directly in front of my house. And um, I'm going to refrain from showing all the houses and stuff like that at this point. I don't want to get that on video. Absolutely. Some folks might be out there hanging out, a little sure. private, give them some privacy. But yeah, this is this is my world right here, Ben. That's great. That looks like paradise. Yeah, so let's let's um, let's, uh, let, let's get on with the interview. Um, my first question for you, Wally, is what is your story? Oh goodness! Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we can be here forever, like some of your other guests have said as well from that question. Um, born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona, as you said. Uh, wasn't a really good um, – well, I had a great childhood. Don't don't let me paint the picture. I didn't have a great childhood, but it was a pretty rough upbringing, pretty rough neighborhood. Um, spent most of my childhood and grew up in a trailer park. I was the dude with the mullet, you know, and uh, I don't know if any of your guests know the um, – there's a movie out there called Spare Parts with George Lopez. If you haven't seen it, look it up. Very inspiring movie about some high school kids who took on some MIT, uh, took on an MIT challenge and won that challenge. And that school that those kids were from was Carl Hayden High School. They called it something else, Carl Hayden Independent or something like that. But that's the high school. That's, that's where those kids came from. That's the high school I graduated from. Uh, about 10% Caucasian and the rest Hispanic. It was a pretty... Uh, Hispanic dominant neighborhood and still is and I couldn't go there right now as I'm told and walk through that neighborhood without knowing somebody and somebody walking by my side because it was a pretty rough upbringing so um, joined the military you know not right out of high I went to college ran out of money for college joined the military did 25 years as an army medic and tr had the opportunity to travel to goodness uh, 23 countries on five continents and all the stuff in between. I mean, there's so many stories in between there. Along the way, uh, I met my wife uh, at my first duty station, which was in Panama in Central America. And we've been married 24 years. We got three boys. One's 22. He's in the Army now. That was his choice. He wanted to do that. I got a 17-year-old getting ready to graduate high school and uh, a 7-year-old who will probably be running down the beach here shortly looking for me. Wow. That's incredible. So, you know, I want to I want to kind of dig a little deeper into your into your past. So, you Absolutely. talked about um, how you had a great childhood, but but you grew up in a rough neighborhood. Could you maybe give a little bit of insight on some of the uh, adversity that you faced and, and really what made it so rough? Yeah, um, really, the neighborhood was uh, it was gangs, um, and as well as. You know, there were drugs involved and, and stuff like that. Um, my dad was, you know, part of, for the most part, part of like a biker group and stuff like that. Although he never rode a bike himself. He always hung around with a lot of bikers and great people. But some of them are pretty shady and some of them are pretty, uh, you know, didn't treat us very well. Let's just put it that way. My dad's, my dad was an extremely kind man uh, to a fault. And a lot of people took advantage of him for that. In fact, one time we went on vacation, and when we came home, it was obvious that somebody had been living in the house the whole time we were in Sacramento visiting my grandmother. Uh, they ate all the food. They helped themselves to what little we had at the time, which was, you know, a tiny little, probably a black and white TV. I mean, you know, we didn't have much, and they took what we had, you know. So, uh, and then we moved around a lot. My dad was always out of out of work. Uh, I remember my dad was a flooring guy. He did carpet. So 
He laid carpet, so we'd he'd always have carpet in the back of the truck. My brother and I'd be up early in the morning, all of us. We'd roll up in the carpet. We would drive down to the food stamp uh, where we'd pick up our food stamps like once a month, I guess. And that's basically, you know, was basically my upbringing. So as well as the neighborhood I lived in, there were always, you know, gang fights and stuff like that. It wasn't nothing like as bad as L.A. would be, like that type, if you imagine that type of gangs. But little gangs and pockets here and there, little cliques. And being a long, blonde-haired white boy in that environment was challenging. But I wouldn't change it for the world. It made me who I am today. I got some amazing friends. Some of them are in prison. Some of them didn't make it. And some of them are doing very well. Uh, you know, we just lived through that type of stuff. So... And then uh, at one point while I was in college and run out of money for college, my uncle was a first sergeant, my dad's brother. My dad was drafted in the Army many years ago and got out. My uncle enlisted, and he retired with 30 years. But when he was a first sergeant, he told me, look, join the military. You're not going to get, you know, you'll be able to travel. You'll get your education eventually. And my answer was not no, but hell no. I had no interest whatsoever. And then finally one day I just got fed up working two full-time jobs, trying to get back into college and get an education because I knew I didn't want to live, continue living in the environment I was living in. So I had to do something. I had to get out. And finally one day I just said, that's it. I went to the recruiter and enlisted as an Army medic. That's crazy. So, you know, I definitely want to want to dig a little bit deeper into um, into how that kind of came into play. Um, but before we move on from your childhood, what do you th you said that it helped to um, mold you into the person that you were today? What sort of things did you learn growing up in that sort of environment that has now contributed to your success today? The biggest thing is I have very little fear. <laughs> very little fear. Uh, I have no fear of, of getting on the phone and calling somebody. If, if somebody gave me, t um, you know, um, goodness, who am I thinking of? Uh, Tony Robbins' number right now, for instance, or anybody. If I had their number right here, I'd call them and say, hey, brother, let's, uh, let's talk. Let's get on the, uh, the podcast, as we'll talk about later, Men of Abundance. I'll say, let's talk. You know, I have something I want to ask you specifically for my audience. Uh, even when I was in the military, I went airborne, jumped out of airplanes. I've been skydiving. Um, sometimes I think I'm a little fearless, again, to a fault, and it rubs off on my kids. My kids are the same way, uh, especially my seven-year-old. He jumps at anything like a lot of kids do, but I just teach them don't have fear, you know, because you never know what the outcome is going to be. I got into a lot of fights when I was a young man, and a lot of it had to do because of my brother. My little brother, my little brother was smaller than me, and I'm not a big man, and uh, but he had that little man syndrome. And every time somebody come up and said, hey, S.A., you was talking stuff to me, you, you know, me and my brothers, I'm not going to cuss or anything like they were. And uh, I said, look, dude, it wasn't me. It was probably my brother because we looked a lot alike at the time. But you're not going to fight my brother, so let's go. You know, and it's just, it, I think, so the biggest thing to answer your question was just uh, I have very little fear of uh, taking chances, doing things I feel that I need to do or things that I even want to do. And, you know, for, for entrepreneurs, I do think that being able to handle that fear is an important characteristic, right? If you're going to either quit your job or jump full-time into entrepreneurship, it's risky. You know, for, for some people, it, it's it's a lot more risky than others. And so you got to be able to handle that fear and overcome it. So I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up. Now, for entrepreneurs who maybe struggle with that, what advice would you give to them to help them overcome that fear? Uh, one of the biggest things I would say is to get an accountability partner or a coach. I think that's, you know, in action, those two things, a get accountability partner and a coach, but the cure for fear is action. Once you take action, well, so think about this. Many people have at least at one point jumped off of a high platform, a diving board or something like that into a pool of water. And most kids, most people, even adults, if they've never done it before or haven't done it in a long time, they're going to hesitate and they're going to sit there and they're going to hesitate. But once they take that first jump, chances are they realize that it's not as bad as they had it in their head. And they're going to realize that, well, I didn't get hurt. I didn't get killed. And actually, it was kind of fun. 
So now I'm going to do it again. And then they do it again and again and again and again. It's because they took that initial action to jump. Matter of fact, (laughs) ironically enough, you might ask me about this later, but it's relevant right now. The book I'm reading right now is called Jump. And I didn't plan that. It just came up in my head, but it's probably because I'm reading this darn book. Um, Just jump. Just take action. The cure for fear is action. And it helps greatly to have an accountability partner or a coach or a mentor, somebody who has been there and done it before you that can give you some pointers to kind of subside some of the fear. Because most of the time, what is fear? Fear is is, is, is the unknown. You don't know what's on the other side. So once you eliminate some of that, it makes it easier to take action. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned having an accountability partner or a coach or even a mentor is really instrumental in, in helping get over that fear. Well, for somebody who maybe doesn't know, and, and I agree with you completely, um, but for somebody who maybe doesn't know how to reach out to those people or find those people or get somebody like that, how would you advise them to go find that individual? First and foremost, pick up their book. If they've written a book or they've got a course on anything, uh, I've got many, many coaches. Jim Rohn is one of my coaches. Never met the guy. I've traveled many, many miles with him in my car. Uh, uh, Tony Robbins, as I mentioned, same thing. Uh, And I take little bits from everybody. I don't agree with everything everybody says, but I take little bits from everybody. So number one is get their book or get their course. And like I was saying earlier, if you do have the gumption, if you you feel up to it, try to contact them. If they do have some sort of a coaching uh, program, Those guys that I just mentioned, you know, Jim Rohn, obviously you can't, but Tony Robbins is going to cost you, you know, $10,000. There's other people out there. And here's a point I want to make on this right here on getting a coach and finding somebody. Find somebody who's a little bit, this is my personal opinion. Find somebody who's a little bit closer to where you're at, a little bit higher. So if you're here in your business venture, you're just getting started, you want somebody who's recently gotten started in the last two to five years, has some has a track record, right? But is a little bit closer to where you're at. And the reason why I say that is because some of the guys that are up higher, one, they're gonna be guys and, and women, men and women that are up higher, that have been doing it longer than you are, their time is very limited, therefore they charge more for their time and not just it, not this, just the money, but their level of knowledge is way higher than where you need to be right now. Perfect example is somebody like um, Gary Vaynerchuk. All right, so many people want to be very, Gary Vaynerchuk who he is today. And they want to start following what he's doing. He's on Snapchat. He's on Periscope. He's on Twitter. He's on everything. He's on everything new. He's on stuff you don't even know that's out there yet. All right. And he's doing all of this stuff. And you see he's got Vayner Media. But see what a lot of people are failing to realize. And it's just not just Gary. It's many other people. are failing to realize where Gary came from when he was doing going door to door and going to yard sales and picking up little trinkets and toys and stuff like that and putting them on eBay. And put now putting them on Craigslist and putting them on stuff like that and had the little YouTube channel that he had with his wine business. So what I'm referring to is the curse of knowledge. They have the curse of knowledge. They may not remember where they started from. Therefore, they have a hard time if unless they have a course that's specifically geared towards you and where you're at today, you're going to have a hard time following and keeping up with that particular course and that coaching and that uh, mentorship. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And and I think that you bring up a really good point. You know, if they've been doing it for 10, 15, 20 years, then they might be a little bit out of touch from when you first started or when they first started. And so I think that's a really good uh, concept of find somebody who maybe two to five years ahead of you because they just did it. They, they, they right. know exactly what they did to get to where they are and it's still fresh in their mind. So I'm, I'm really glad you brought up that point. Now, right. let's. I want to move on a little bit to your, um, st- still in your past, but but a little bit further than your childhood. So um, you, had a, you had a rough upbringing, but then um, from high school, did you go straight into college? And where did you go to college? And, and can you maybe give some insight on, on those years of your life? <laughs> Actually, um, right out of high school, I had a full ride scholarship. Actually, it was a community college, but it was a big deal to me. I had a full ride scholarship for track. 
I was a very fast young man. I don't know if you've ever seen this. an old movie called The Jericho Mile. <laughs> I was the dude with the long blonde hair running track. And uh, I had a full ride scholarship. They were going to pay for everything. And I was just going to run for um, Phoenix Community College. I declined. I did not wasn't interested. I didn't do well in school. I wasn't interested in doing more school. And uh, I really just kind of wanted to get on with my life, and even though I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> so I worked in the restaurant industry for, for quite a while. My very first job actually in high school uh, was at a meat plant, and I was, you know, slaughtering cat. They, they slaughtered cattle, and I hung the meat and stuff like that and counted out all the different hearts and tongues and all this crazy stuff. But Right after high school, I went to work. I went to work for a restaurant, and uh, there in Phoenix. And it was a high. It was a. I was a busboy at the. It was called the French Corner, where I met um, Martin Sheen. Uh, a lot of celebrities would come in and out of that place. And finally, I, then I took on another job working at the. It was called the Wigwam Resort, where a lot of uh, senators and retirees end up going. And uh, like I said, I was working those two jobs trying to get back in, trying to get to college. And then once I got into college, I was paying my own way, ran out of money, then started doing the same thing over again. Took on two more jobs trying to get raise more money to get back into college. And originally I was going to college. Uh, I originally in high school wanted to be an attorney. And I didn't realize how many different types of attorneys there were. But uh, along the way, I realized in high school, the one subject I was good at in high school was anatomy and physiology. I excelled in that. So I knew I wanted to do something medical. So I went into college to, to be a physical therapist. That's what I originally wanted to do. And that's originally why when I did decide that I was going to join the military, that I wanted to do something medical. And that's why I became an Army medic. And so you talked about it a little bit, but what was that um, the the impetus for the for the transition between being a college student um, who wanted to study anatomy or, or something in the medical field to joining um, the military? And, and can you maybe give some insight on how you took that leap? Yeah, well, most people tell you they join the military for you know, pride for the country and, and all of this stuff. And that's absolutely no, not why I joined at all. I joined for two reasons. One, to get out of the environment that I was in. And two, because as my uncle mentioned to me, I would eventually get some education along the way. And I did. It took me 24 years. Once I, from uh, the moment I went to basic training in, in El Paso, Texas, I absolutely fell in love with the structure. I fell in, that's what I needed in my life. I needed that structure. And I had some really good mentors in my drill sergeants. I had two drill sergeants that were just amazing men. They were father figures to me. And I ran into them later on in my career. But um, I loved it from that point on. But when my uncle had that conversation with me, he was home on leave. And he said, like I said earlier, he said, look, you know, the military isn't for everybody, but based on what you want to do, you're going to get out of this environment and you're going to get some education along the way. And that's the, the main reason why I joined the military. And then about, I think it was about nine or 10 years in, I was spent. I was done because at that point, my wife and I had been married about seven years and we had literally been together less than three years because of deployments uh, field exercises and military schools I had attended. We sat down and looked, you know, looked at the calendar what we did over the last seven years. We literally were together less than three years, and it was taking a toll on our marriage. We had one boy at the time, and then two r shortly after that, uh, and um, I was ready to just get out. I got reassigned to El Paso, back to where I started from, and again had some really good mentors and really good leaders put me in good positions. Kind of caught my second wind, if you will, and then went ahead and re-enlisted, and 25 years later, I just retired two two years ago. Matter of fact, this month, two years ago. Well, that's incredible, and, and thank you very much for, for everything that you've done. Um, but could you, maybe, um, could you maybe give a little bit of insight on um, what, what you learned in that, in that time, and, and what sort of... Uh, things you you brought back from from that experience that has now led to your success today from the military experience yes okay leadership uh, 
being able to operate and, and manage people. Uh, you know, I, I was only like three years in before I got promoted to sergeant. And at that point in time is when you start becoming a leader of soldiers. And actually before that, because they promote you based on your, not just your potential of what you're going to do, but what you've already done. And you've already shown potential in leadership. So, I mean, one of my first assignments while I was in the military was when I was stationed in Panama, I went to Bolivia for three months and I was the one of two medics uh, with a group of engineers that were drilling water wells in in uh, in Bolivia, and see these are these are the assignments, these are the missions, these are the things that most people don't realize that the military do- did and still does. Bolivia was in a five-year water drought, and we were there drilling water wells. And one of the things I learned from that first experience was one I had never been outside of Phoenix other than California, and then here I am in Panama, and seeing how people live there in Panama. Then I go to Bolivia and I see people living in grass huts while I'm sta- I'm living in a hotel in the city, which was, I guess, maybe about, <laughs> it seemed like 40 years behind time uh, of the US. But I'm seeing the living standards there. Then I go out, we drive out like 20 miles and we're literally in grass huts. And the people are just the most amazing people. We drill, We drilled 28 water wells for this community for all over Bolivia. And every time, take about 72 hours, about three days to drill one water well. Every time we were done, they would throw a big party for us. Cause I'm telling you, when you take clean water to a community, you have made some lifelong friends. And that touched me when I saw how the people were living, what we were able to bring to them and what we were able to do for them. That was when I truly started taking on a whole mindset of service and the leadership is one thing that I got from the whole experience, but the service to others, because on top of Bolivia, I was in, I, I'm, I'm not going to mention all the countries I've been to, you know, 23 some odd countries, but, you know, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, all these different countries, all these places I've been, uh, I just get a chance to see the living standards and see how people live, but still live a very happy and fulfilling life. As long as they have those basic necessities, water, you know, quality food and all of that stuff. It just, it's part of the reason why I continue doing what I do today and serving people. Absolutely. And so, you know, you you talked a little bit about leadership. Uh, Can you maybe give a little bit of insight on why leadership is so important, uh, both in life and especially in entrepreneurship? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, so many people go through life not really knowing what they want to do with their own life. And that's just a sad state of affairs. So first and foremost, you have to be able to lead your own goals and dreams and decide what you want to do and then go after them like we were talking about earlier. Just take action and do what, do what it is you want to do. But in entrepreneurship, if you're going to start building a business, then you're taking on a very, very huge responsibility. Because chances are, now there's a lot of solopreneurs out there, and that's myself as well. I'm more of a side hustle, really. But if you don't take on those, when you, if you start to build a business and taking on employees, you've got a huge responsibility because chances are there are going to be times, especially when you first get started, you're not going to get paid. It's your responsibility to take care of those employees so that they're building your empire and helping you build your business and helping you build your dream but you owe a huge debt of responsibility to them. And one of a great book that I do recommend because I like the content is leaders. I think it's leaders eat last by Simon Sinek. And it's exactly right. He gets a lot of that from the military. uh, And you take care of those people that are around you. They will take care of you. When you take care of people that are around you, when you lead them properly, and you let them, you give them, you empower them to do the things that they need to do to help you run your business, then they're going to work with you, not just for you. Because working for you, they're just there for a paycheck. But if they're working with you, then they're invested in what you're doing. Absolutely. I think it's a great point. And, you know, I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek as well. Um, his book, Start With Why, is also a great one about, you know, inspiring action uh, instead of just, you know, aiming for it. Um, but 
you know, in addition to leadership, you also mentioned service to others. And mm-hmm. can can you maybe give a little bit of insight on again why having a service to others mentality um, is so important as an entrepreneur? <laughs> Entrepreneurship. So many people think believe when they first get started, I want to start a business because I need to make more money. That's the wrong answer. And trust me, I've done this time and time again. It took. I'm just hard headed, man. It took me so many times to realize that. I have no business starting a a business for money. If you don't start your business to serve a need, to serve other people, then you may get initial success, but it's not going to be long lasting. The whole, the whole premise of entrepreneurship is to serve others. And another great book to pick up, and I'll mention a lot of books, is a book by Yannick Silver called uh, Evolved Enterprise. And what that book is about is it talks about this whole kind of new concept called uh, for purpose businesses. It's kind of a twist on on a nonprofit organization and a for profit business, but it's a business that starts out with a purpose. One perfect perfect example, I think it's called Sam's Shoes. I think it's Sam's Shoes. I may be getting that wrong. But Sam Shoes started on the premise, and this is a perfect example. Sam Shoes started on the premise of for every shoe that they sell, they're going to give another shoe, a pair of shoes, to a kid in need, to another country or to wherever. <clears throat> for every single unit that's sold, they're going to give another unit to a kid in need or whoever. And that is starting a business on purpose. And their purpose was to get people that need shoes, shoes, right? And at the same time, they're making a profit. So to make a perfect example of why it doesn't work for companies who started out for a profit, which is not bad. I'm not saying you shouldn't start a business for a profit. It's just when you start for a purpose and then try to change your change your mission statement, it may not work out very well. Perfect example is Skechers try to do the same thing years into their organization but it wasn't written into their business plan and let's just say it didn't work out as well as they thought it would because they went about it the wrong way i think the people know they you just feel the 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 vibe you just feel the difference people are buying sketchers already they like the shoes they're good shoes but when they tried to change their business model it just wasn't working out because it wasn't originally built on that premise does that answer your your question question? absolutely absolutely and uh, I believe I believe it's uh, the company you're talking about is Tom's Shoes. Yeah, there um, you go, there you go. Yeah. But uh, you know that that's a great point that you bring up. Um, the man who actually started that, um, I've actually written about written about this this very topic. Uh, he mm-hmm. he went to Argentina in like 2006 for vacation. He had been an entrepreneur. He had started a few different things, and he was going around uh, the the country and just immersing himself in the culture. You know, he was drinking the mm-hmm. national wine, which is Malbec. He was, um, you know, learning the national dance, which is tango, and, and he wore the national shoe, which is the Alpargata. And he just so happened to come across this one um, person who was a, a, another American who got him to go and volunteer at this children's shelter. And she was helping to give shoes to these children because they didn't have – any, they didn't have anything. They didn't have any shoes. And they had to walk to school. They had to walk to get water. They had to walk to go to the doctor. And so because they didn't have any shoes, they would get these blisters on their feet and they would get diseases and a lot of them would die. And so that sparked his 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 purpose-driven self. And so he, he got some shoes. He went back to the United States. And within that first summer, he got back to the U.S. in that first summer, he had sold over 10,000 pairs of shoes. And, and wow. he's, he's worth over over three hundred million dollars or, or something uh, similar to that today. So that's a great point uh, that you bring up about a, a for purpose business. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so you know we talked a little bit about your past. Um, could you maybe give a little bit of insight on what you're doing on what you're doing now? I'm sorry, you're cutting you're cutting out a little bit there. I didn't hear you. Okay. Um, it, it sounds like there's a plane going over you or something. What's that? Sounds like there's a plane going over you or something. Yeah, yeah. We have one of the, the Hickam Air Force bases right here and the flight line's going over. There you go. 
anyways, um, we, we talked a little bit about your past. I want to talk about what you're doing now. Um, you know, what, what are you working on? Where's your focus? Where's your head at? Uh, and, and what are you really doing right now? Right. So after I retired two years ago, um, I took about four months off and I just started doing, you know, little business ventures here and there. I started a, uh, residential cleaning business and I was getting into that and I was getting into some other things as well. I already had some stuff going on with residual income coming in. And then I get a call, (laughs) I get a call from the office, the same office I retired from, and they offered me a job to work back there in the same position I was at, basically the same thing I was doing without all the other, uh, there's so many things we do in the military as NCOs as active duty. Uh, So I was just going to basically be doing one or two jobs. So I thought on it a little bit and I decided, you know what, might as well. You know, I enjoy doing the job. I enjoy doing that. I'm still serving soldiers, still serving the nation. And, you know, so that's what I do full time during the day, Monday through Friday. Now, in addition to that, I still have my side hustle. I still have businesses going on. I still have income coming in. But one of my biggest projects right now that I am so passionate about that I've been doing for about the last six months is this podcast called Men of Abundance. And that came because I was realizing, can you still hear me? Because it's kind of windy out here right now. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So that came because about, again, about two years ago while I was had all this time off and I'm reflecting and I'm thinking about everything that's going on, I'm like, you know what? I've been chasing this shiny thing my entire adult life. I've done everything from internet marketing to literally I started an internet, uh, a satellite dish business, installation and sales business. Uh, I did that while I was in Iraq, by the way. That's a whole different story. I, uh, you know, I have, I've been in multi-level marketing, all kinds of different affiliate marketing, all kinds of stuff, just chasing this shiny thing. And I got a little bit out of that here and there, but I made a realization about two years ago while I had all this time off and reflecting and just reading a lot more and, you know, communicating and connecting with a lot of guys that I am in fact truly living a life of abundance. I live in Hawaii. I got a, like I already said, I got a beautiful family, healthy kids. I don't worry about too much as compared to I did when we were coming up into a young family, you know, bill collectors calling all the time and all this stuff. So I decided I was going to, I got connected with a friend of mine who is over on Maui and he teaches people how to write books and all this stuff and he gave me some great ideas so I just said I'm gonna write this book called living your life of abundance as I was writing the book I realized it's too much of me in the book and I didn't want the book to be about me I do want to inject my learning and what I've learned along the way but I didn't want it to be about me then I kind of got into podcasts even more at the time I was just listening to like Shalene Johnson stuff introduced me to Gary Vaynerchuk introduced me to Ryan Daniel Moran of Freedom Fast Lane and I started realizing, long story short, I can, st- and then of course I got introduced to John Lee Dumas, who had his short course, his free course on how to start a podcast. I was, and I took that course. I was like, I can do that. And here's what's going to happen when I do that. Here's why I wanted to do that. When I do that, when I start this podcast, it's going to give a reason for people to want to talk to me because I'm going to build an audience. And right now I'm in 36 countries around the world. And these people are going to have an audience. They're not, they would never just talk to me for an hour, right? But if I give them an audience and I promote what they're doing and I share their story, then maybe they'll talk to me. And sure enough, there we go. I've talked to Jay Papazan, the co-author of The One Thing. I've talked to people that don't even have businesses. They're just doing amazing things in their community and they're living their life of abundance. So I'm having these conversations with these people and I'm gathering information for my book. So yes, it's kind of selfish in that regard. And I'm learning even more as I go. Ever since I made that realization that I'm truly living a life of abundance, so much more came into my life like that. Just like that. I mean, literally, it happened just like that. People started saying, hey, Wally, you know, I, you know, I know somebody who's got this going on and they, you might want to talk to them. This was even before the podcast. You might want to talk to them about this. I got introduced to uh, the gentleman over on Maui uh, that's, uh, that's teaching me, you know, my, my coach for helping me write the book. And then once I started the podcast, 
I mean, it just, people just flooding in, flooding in so many people and not even people just introducing me for the podcast, just introducing me just to great people just to have conversations with. I talked to Kay Wilkins, who is the CEO of the American Red Cross. Can you imagine that? That is just the most amazing thing. This is a phenomenal woman. I talked to, um, in fact, this week, the episode's going to launch um, uh, David um, Sanderson. He was the last passenger to get off the plane that landed in the Hudson. Wow. I had a conversation with this guy. He's an amazing individual. And that episode, I'm so excited to launch that episode this week. It's just amazing the things that have happened. So, and, and on top of that, I'm lifting other people up. People that are just getting started in their, in their speaking deals. They want to be an author. And now I have an email. Matter of fact, I'm going to do a bonus. I get people sending me emails. This is the most amazing thing. This is my favorite part, and I did not expect this at all. It wasn't part of my whole thought process, but I knew I could help some guys out by sharing these conversations, but now I get emails, and I'm going to read one later. It's going to be a bonus episode that's going to launch tomorrow, that's going to post tomorrow, from a guy who tells me he's com- I've completely changed his life. Between myself and the guests that I've had on, it's completely... Um, helped him take that action we were talking about earlier. He's been afraid to take action. And now he's taking an action and starting his own real estate business skills. He already has, he's just been sitting on it and he's partnering with somebody else. Those emails are just the most amazing thing that happened throughout my entire day. Other than, you know, what happens within my own personal family. Wow. That's incredible. So, you know, in, in everything that you're doing and, and, and everything that, has kind of transformed for you. Um, what do you think is your favorite part about being an entrepreneur? Just the freedom and, and literally just the freedom because even though I work a full-time job right now, that's by choice. I could completely quit that job. And to be quite honest with you, with the income that I have right now, the residual income and everything else that I have coming in, because I'm not making a dime from my podcast. It's just everything else is sustaining. Um, in fact, my podcast is costing me money at this point, which is fine. I'm, I'm excited about that. But uh, the job I could just completely do away with, and I could, I would not be able to stay here in Hawaii in the same lifestyle, quite frankly. I could easily move to Florida. I could move to Texas. I could move to another country and completely just you know, be happy just doing that, get another job if I want to, or, you know, just ramp up what I'm doing with my podcast and, and at one point get some sponsors or some other things that I have coming up that will be revenue generating is in this process, a very big honor is a couple guys have asked me to coach them in living a life of abundance and complete transparency. I've coached for about five years in health and fitness. I can coach and I've coached throughout my entire military career, but to coach somebody in, in learning how to live a life of abundance, that's new to me. <laughs> so I'm working with some coaches and some mentors to help me build a program for that. But to answer your question, it's just freedom. I don't, I could walk out of this job right now. We could relocate and be extremely happy and love what, love what we're doing because I already know that I have a life of abundance. I already have my happiness. And I don't want to paint a picture that everything's perfect because it's, you know, stuff happens just like with everybody else. Stuff happens with people who make $200,000 a month, just as it happens to people who make $20,000 a year. Uh, But I just have a different mindset when it comes to dealing with that at this point. So um, I'm very resilient. One of the things I was trained in the military to do was to be a master resiliency trainer and to be resilient with myself and those around me. Absolutely. And so, you know, you've been, you've been talking about living a life of abundance, um, the, you know, a, a lot during the, the show. So I got to ask, what is, in, in, for your definition, what is a life of abundance and how do we as entrepreneurs get there? Wow. First off, before I do that, I want to show you guys something. We have a submarine, and this happens quite often. I live right on Pearl Harbor. Mind if I do this real quick? Please, I don't know if please. You can see it. Really cool. I don't even know if you can, you can see it. There's a submarine going through the channel. Wow. Right now. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. That's awesome. It's moving. Isn't that sweet? Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> that's rare, man. 
well it happens here all the time but it's rare for other people to be able to see that um living a life of abundance to me is just like you know really being an entrepreneur but you do not have to be an entrepreneur to live a life of abundance a full-on 100 percent entrepreneur because i'm not at this point like i said i still have a full-time job because i truly enjoy what i'm doing if you enjoy what you're doing and you're able to provide for your family and here's the extra key to living a life of abundance for me this is my definition is to be able to give to others to be able to do something for others and it doesn't always mean writing a check it doesn't always mean going to the soup you know going downtown and and feeding the homeless which we have plenty here in Hawaii uh, it, it could mean just giving some sharing some of your knowledge with somebody else sitting down with a young man or a young lady that's having some issues in their life and just guiding them in the right direction because unfortunately some of them don't have the parental guidance that they should and that's not on their parents because some of their parents weren't raised properly and they don't have the skills and knowledge and sometimes your kids those kids don't even want to listen to their parents even though they do have the skills and knowledge case in point one of the guys that I've recently connected with through the podcast uh, that I've personally interviewed also works with kids and helping them build a their own business my 17 year old is extremely entrepreneurial so I'm connecting them to and he's doing that pro bono he's not charging anything he's gonna work with my son to help him get his business I, I that just makes me feel so good just even saying that so sum it up living a life of abundance is doing what you truly love to do having the freedom to make the decisions that you want to make for yourself and your family and being able to give back to your community to others or on an even global scale like pencils of promise or something of that nature or like we were talking about earlier Tom's shoes um, and I apologize for getting that wrong but that's just my brain I just got so much stuff going on I don't always recall everything perfectly but um, and how you can do it Wow that's what I'm working on man Ben, that's that's what I'm working on I mean to, to number one the easiest thing to do is just to realize everything you have around you the one thing that I'll tell you to do start doing right away right now that will make a difference is to have an attitude of gratitude every single morning every morning I wake up even before I get out of bed and somebody's name pops into my head and it could be my wife or it could be somebody I hadn't talked to in years and I'll and I'll and I'm a, I'm a religious man I'm a man of faith and I'll, I'll say a prayer for them and when I get up in the morning and part of my morning routine is I write in my journals I actually have four journals that I write in and one of them starts out with gratitude what am I grateful for today sometimes it's almost always my wife my kids but sometimes it's something as simple as I had a dry bed to sleep in last night you know I had I have a coffee pot to wake up to you know I have clean water to wake up to any number of things but every single day write it down every single day you don't have to keep it write it down and throw it away if you want to but every single day something about putting pen to paper and writing down what you're grateful for and saying it and one I'll give you one other tip that I do <laughs> and I'm doing it right now look in the mirror in the morning and smile I'm talking a huge smile smile you cannot be angry you cannot be sad you cannot be you're just gonna start your whole day off when you, you when you see somebody when you see a baby smile try not to smile you just gotta smile so I don't know it sounds kind of weird I know but trust me these are the things that I know works for me give it a try my work for you too absolutely and that that really is great advice um, because I think when you when you start the day off and you're you're just showing gratitude and you're basically telling yourself wow things could be so much worse and I'm so glad that I am who I am and I am where I am and um, I have what I have and you know if you if you look at it from that point of view I absolutely agree with you I mean your whole day is just gonna be it's, it's gonna be so much better um, and then to the point of smiling, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I mean, I actually think it's scientifically proven when you smile you and, and, and you kind of force yourself to smile a little bit, it actually tricks your brain into, into um, releasing the, some chemicals that make you happy. And then that makes you smile more, and which makes you happier. So, it, you know, it's a positive cycle. Um, but, but yeah, absolutely. I challenge – I actually would like to challenge everybody that's listening – 
um, to start doing that. Every day, wake up, say at least one thing that you're grateful for and, and put a big old smile on your face. Um, you know, I, I definitely thank you for, for that tip. So, you know, we talked a little bit about your past. Uh, we talked a little bit about what you're doing now. Um, but, but what does the future hold for you? Um, like, where, where do you see yourself going in the next couple of years? Oh, wow. Um, actually, you know, 25 years in the military, we, my, my family and I moved every three to four years, generally every three years. We only stayed one other location four years. And we've been here six years. <laughs> So it's about time for us to relocate. So we're already looking for uh, someplace in Florida because we just got to have this type of weather. And I know it's hotter in Florida, but it's right now it's about maybe 75, 80 degrees. Um, but we see us relocating in the near future, uh, Florida or Texas. But as far as what we'll be doing, when we do relocate, I see myself putting full 100% uh, focus and attention and effort into my men of abundance community and my men of abundance podcast. I already put a lot of hours into this. I absolutely love what I'm doing. I started out as a three day a week show, technically a four day a week show, but really a three day a week interview show. And I came out of the gates way too fast. I underestimated how much work it takes. So some guys, you know, um, Jeff Woods and, and many other podcasters has been out there for quite a while. I had a conversation with them and they said, look, dude, break it down to one, one day a week, focus more on, on sharing your content and, and writing your blog. And by the way, my blog, I do video blogs. I do live Facebook videos and then I, they post directly to my blog on my live journey at, at men of abundance. But, um, yeah, I see me just putting more time and effort into that and really just growing this whole community. And eventually, possibly, one thing I would like to do is start traveling around and, and speaking about it and talking about it and just sharing to a broader audience uh, for those who want to listen and those who want to live a life of abundance and just live happily. Uh, those are the conversations I would like to travel around and have. Absolutely. So um, if you had to say, and I still want, uh, you know, I still want to talk about your future, if, uh, if you had to say the one thing that you had to accomplish in your lifetime, what would that be? What would you want to leave behind as your legacy? My boys. I mean, it sounds cliche, but truly just to be uh, an example to my boys and that my efforts in life live on with them on a bigger scale. I'm already I'm putting content out there that's going to be out there forever as long as podcasts survive, <laughs> you know. Uh, and I repurpose a lot of that stuff into video and and my blog and stuff like that. Uh, I would like to live on a broader scale. I would like to leave a much bigger impact. I want to write a couple books. Uh, one I already mentioned, "Living Your Life of Abundance." I've got some others that are in my head that are just dying, just screaming to be set free. Uh, and uh, so. Yeah, I definitely want to do that. I want to have some content out there, some evergreen content and some knowledge and information that would help others along their journey. One of the things that we find as we go through life, especially as you start having kids and raising them is and even just look around. We don't learn from those that have already come before us. We just don't. And we all know we should. As we get older, we know, dang, I wish I would have known that when I was 15. But at 15, I wasn't receptive to that. You know, it's just the way it is. So everybody's at different stages of their lives. And I would like to provide content for those who reach that stage and are ready to live that life of abundance. That's awesome, man. Well, if uh, if, if anybody wanted to reach out to you and, and get in contact with you, uh, what would be the best way that they could? The best way is just to go to menofabundance.com. Everything is there. Um, I could sit here and listen, list all the social media, all the social platforms that I'm on, but they're all listed up there at the top of the web page. I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube. I mean, they're all up. They're all up there. So, uh, yeah, the quickest way, easiest way, is just go to menofabundance.com and uh, check out the podcast if it's something that uh, you know, it just might be something that will inspire you. Absolutely. And and I have one more question for you. Uh, and then we'll then we'll wrap up the show for today. 
but is there anything about yourself that you think is an important part of who you are that I did not ask you about today? In other words, what did I miss? You did pretty good. I like your questions. I like I like the uh, everything that you asked me. I just have. Uh, I think I already said it though, but I already I just have this huge desire to serve. Uh, as as much as I did, you know, I want to make a point that when people think about the military, they think about all these movies that you see and platoon and you know band of brothers and all this other kind of stuff but in a peacetime environment and even when we're at war we're still doing peacetime efforts most of my missions most of the things that i've done in the military i did spend a year in, in iraq uh and uh and albania those were not necessarily peacetime but we do some amazing things for the world we really do drilling water wells for Bolivia, um, building houses and schools throughout South and Central America. I was involved with all of that. And it just, it's just a life of servitude. It really is. And that's what I want to continue doing. I just want to continue serving others, sharing my knowledge. Uh, been married 24 years. I see people, you know, on the internet all the time having troubles with their family, with their, with their finances. Uh, that's a real issue. And one point I want to make about that right there for those of you out there who are spe specifically, I want to speak specifically to those who may be in like in network marketing industry or something like that. Some of those are sold and trying to get people to buy a Ferrari next week and, and make a million bucks in even five years. Man, don't focus on that. $250 a month will change a family's life. $500 a month will change a family's life. Quit thinking about how much money you're going to make off of this individual and think about how you're going to serve that person at where they're at today. Where are they at today? What's truly going to be the best benefit for them? And that comes from my giving mentality. That comes from my attitude of gratitude and, and wanting to serve others. Absolutely fantastic. So for everybody listening, I, I do want to I do want to thank you and, and Wally. I want to thank you for coming on the show today. Definitely go check out his podcast if you want to live a life of abundance. Um, and I think everybody does. So I very highly suggest that you check that out. Um, Wally's a great guy. Uh, reach out to him. Uh, you will um, you can definitely benefit from from talking to him. So, uh, but before we go, I just want to say thank you um, to again Wally to you, but but also to everybody that's listening. Um, you guys and gals are the reason that we that we do this, Paul and I, and um, you know uh, it, it brings me great pleasure to be able to um, you know have your attention and, and, and have some of your time. Uh, so I hope that you find value in this show and this podcast. And I just want to say thank you so much for listening. So to everybody, this has been another Project Egg interview. Today we've been talking to Wally Carmichael from Phoenix, Arizona. Take care. Hello. Take care, guys.